Okay. <clears throat> hey folks, how's it going? Uh, this is a quick audio check. We'll get started here in just a minute. Uh, welcome for those joining in for the first time here uh, on my channel for some of the live streams that I do, uh, being able to interact, sketch, draw, uh, give advice, uh, advice and also directions on things related to art and education. Um, but today we're going to keep it pretty simple and straightforward uh, where, you know, this is the first uh, live stream for the new year of 2024 and we'll be going into just a few sketchbooks and maybe draw a little bit uh, i'm going to be testing out some different materials uh, things i just recently got and i wanted to see how they felt uh, this is a uh, metal nib pen that was brought over from japan and i'll tell you all about this stuff and just as i begin uh, into it so for the time being just to let people know in terms of how this works obviously questions are welcome and I do a bit of interaction here and there. So, of course, people that ask questions related to the things that we're talking about, I will definitely get into um, and give as best of a answer as I can. Uh, do understand that anything here is based on just opinion and uh, you know experience of things I've gone through from teaching and working in the industry for the last 15 plus years. So uh, just take it as you will. Um, obviously, questions that are not related to this, I may just skip over, but I'm going to be filtering it myself. I don't necessarily have moderators in here, so I'll be just using my own eyes to kind of gauge who I should maybe talk to. If I skip a question or miss it, uh, I just didn't happen to answer it, even though it's related, uh, I'll try to go back and, and look at them again. Uh, You're more than welcome to repeat questions if I miss them, so please don't hesitate to do so. Uh, but, you know, be respectful for others that are here and uh, respectful for the time that I'm giving you guys on this uh, session. But uh, these kind of live streams, like I said, are kind of intermittent pop-up, and uh, they'll jump up once in a while. Uh, I try to keep a schedule if I can, but this new year I'll try to be committed to it, and we'll see if I can do it, maybe even like once a week or so. Uh, but in any case, the best thing to do is follow me on Instagram, on Peter Han Style, and you'll find live stories go up there, knowing when I'll be popping up, usually about a half an hour beforehand, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a session. So in any case, I wanted to have a couple of sketchbooks here that I can maybe use. Uh, mainly because of the fact that what I want to draw with the, with this metal nib. I don't know exactly how well this draws on top of certain surfaces of paper. So uh, I may be using um, this particular book, but it's really heavily textured. It's the handmade paper that I showed just recently on Instagram. Uh, this is made by the company called Kadi Papers. Um, I don't know exactly you know what their website is. I, I just found it at an art store. I don't know anything else about them. Just testing it out. This one I bought in Japan. Uh, this particular book, uh, again, is um, looks like Muse Paper, M-U-S-E, Muse Paper. Uh, this one I brought over from Japan earlier last year. I've uh, been using this one for a little bit. This one is the uh, Etcher Accordion Book. This one's more of a watercolor paper. So each of these papers are actually very different. Um, this one being, again, a cold press watercolor paper, has a bit of a texture to it, should handle the nib pretty well. I may use it in case the other ones fail. Uh, I'm gonna probably go to the textured paper first and see how that works. If I don't, I'll go to then the Muse paper afterwards. And this one is more like a, um, it is a bit of a watercolorish type paper. It's got a texture to it. Uh, it's not very thick, probably about an 80 pound paper. It's not that super heavy. Um, but I'm also assuming that this paper may have been pressed to create that texture. I'm not sure if that's actual natural fibers coming through. I'm not sure 100%. Uh, but this paper seems pretty nice. I've been using ink with it primarily, so it feels pretty good. Uh, it's smoother to a degree, so I may come to this one if, again, this one doesn't work. So uh, what we have here is that Cotty paper, and this is just a spiral ring bound. Uh, it looks like handmade pressed paper. It's pretty heavily dense texture. This is the cover of it, which is a little bit thicker of a stock compared to the inner paper. It does have a slight yellow cream to it. Uh, it's not the whitest of papers, but um, it is nice. So I've been sketching with this from starting of last year. I uh, started with around maybe September, drawing some of the animals when I was out in the Masai Mara. So these were some of the observational drawings and drawings from photographs and whatnot, watercolor stuff. I've shared some of this stuff on Instagram already, but I don't think I've showed this stuff on a live stream as much maybe. I can't even remember. Um, <laughs> I can't remember when the last time I was on live, uh, but that's how long it's been. But again, like, uh, like I said, it's really thankful that you guys are always present and showing up when you can. Um, but here just kind of gives you an idea of what I've done with this particular book. Uh, and the stuff I'm drawing with for the pen work over here has primarily been uh, fountain pens. These fountain pens, which worked fairly well. The heavy texture with metal tips can be a little bit finicky because it can skip a little bit here in times. This is just Prismacolor pencil. So because it's prism color, the amount of rubbing or smudging is not going to be as much as graphite. 
which is why I like Prismacolor waxier pencils quite a bit more. Um, so this is a, a nice option for, for if you find that when you draw a lot with graphite or charcoal that you're doing a lot of smudging, uh, Prismacolor pencil I find to be a much better option. These are quick on-site sketches. This is a Lion Pride, a Runkai Pride. And this is just recent sketches that I've done. Uh, this one is done with the Crystal Ballpoint, the very common, simple ballpoint pens that you can buy pretty much anywhere. Uh, I would say out of all ballpoints and ones that you can even find as like high uh, quality or expensive versions of ballpoints, really at the end of the day, a crystal like this one made by Bic is perfectly awesome. It's It doesn't coagulate with ink. It doesn't roll. It doesn't smudge. Uh, it can if you really rub into it, but uh, this is a really solid basic ballpoint pen. I usually just buy a pack of like 100, you know, and I, I just have it with me. Honestly, one will last me a long time. So the pack that I bought will probably last me a year, if not more, honestly. Um, but the ballpoint here looks pretty nice. It, it doesn't, I mean, it's nice and dark. Uh, there are certain ballpoints where the ink can be much richer to a degree, but I would say the big crystal is pretty solid, honestly. Uh, so this is that recent sketch I've done. This is one I just finished up yesterday, and I beat this paper up. Okay, so I was using this ballpoint and I was really working into this paper, really testing it out. Um, this is a, a really good kind of like sign for me in terms of just how it holds up. Usually a lot of other kind of papers, let's say it's like watercolor paper and whatnot. Uh, if you use a lot of wet mediums, it can definitely tear up, roll and pill. With the Bic, if you really work into it, again, you can kind of work your way through the paper all the way to the other side, basically just kind of rubbing your way through it. Uh, but this one held up pretty nicely. You can kind of see the actual uh, degradation of the paper literally just being pressed and flattened, essentially what's happening with the metal tip. Uh, but the paper held up really nicely. And so this one was good. Again, no smudge on it. Uh, straight up ballpoint on just this rough paper. You can kind of see the roughness of the edge. And it's not super thick, but it is coarse. Uh, watercolor work really nicely on this one. It will buckle for sure, uh, but it should flatten out over when it dries with having a slight waveness to it, a little bit of an ironing, it should flatten out pretty nicely. But I really like natural papers the most at times because it's just some of the tactile feeling I enjoy. Uh, when I was younger, you know, in high school to college years, it was all about smooth, smooth paper, like Bristol's and stuff like that, vellums as well too. Uh, but as I got older, I, I find found textured paper to have a little bit more character and personality in a way. Uh, certain materials can kind of respond to me in that, in that sense. Uh, the way they feel, the way they sound, the way they respond uh, from the pens to the papers. They're all so specific and particular. And as you kind of mature uh, through your skill sets, you start to become sensitive to these languages. So rough papers like this one here, I find much more favorable. When I was younger, I really didn't like them because a lot of times they would bleed or they would feel really, uh, it, it would hinder my movements. Um, but you know, over time, it's gotten obviously my favoritism to this has become a lot stronger. Um, yeah, the paper really held up, Ellie. Uh, again, like I said, it's it's really thin in these areas now, where it's much thicker in this area, and the paper's texture is smoothed out because of the roller. And really, I just basically pressed it, and I worked into it really hard, uh, multiple multiple layers of the ballpoint ink. Uh, so if if it holds up with a metal tip ballpoint, um, other kind of pens should be perfectly fine. Now, of course, much wetter inks, fountain pens or brushes and stuff like this with multi layers. I mean, with water itself, it's gonna unbind the fibers, you know, over time. Uh, so that can be a little bit harsher, I would say. Water can be a really harsh medium. Uh, but with this ballpoint ink or any, any sort of regular ink, it should be pretty good. So today, I am going to be using one of these dip pens. I recently just got this. Literally yesterday. It was a gift. Uh, in terms of brand, it comes from this company, Kakimori. And this is from Japan. Uh, brought over as a gift, like I said. Looking for like a website or anything like that. This is just a little info sheet that came with it in a package. Uh, and the kind of felt tip this is, it's not like the classical nibs where they have a flex in the, um, the needle tip, but this is a 360 spiral, uh, basically a cone uh, edge nib. And I can bring it a little bit closer to the camera. You can kind of see it better, but it does have slight edge grooves right inside the middle um, conical form. And it, I think those grooves hold the ink inside of it. Now, I don't know exactly how much ink this will hold, uh, but we're going to find out. If I take out the nib, it is actually not hollow on the interior. There's a little cup right here that obviously sockets into the handle, but I think the end piece is solid, is what it seems like. Uh, I thought it was hollow it's at first, which is interesting. The tip is pretty sharp. I, I, I'm curious about the kind of line it'll create. 
I'm going to assume like a 0 0.3 felt tip, I would say, is probably what you're going to get from something like this. Um, but we'll see how this works. And the kind of ink that I'm going to be using, and this is a, a Kakimori uh, nib, K-A-K-I-M-O-R-I. Uh, so the nib or the ink I'm going to be using is the good old platinum carbon ink. This is a fresh new uh, bottle in a, in a box. I, I have a stock of like two or three of these and uh, I've been using a couple other ones as well. This ink I've been using a little bit. This is made by Pilot. Uh, the bottle of it is in my bag right now so I didn't get it. But this is for drawing use but it doesn't necessarily have a, a permanence to it. It can bleed after even drawing a little bit. So it's nice. It's good. Really, and I've been turning to this more for fountain pens due to the fact that a carbon ink even though I've been using these for years, it can be harsh on fountain pens uh, at times, especially if you don't, if, you have a, if I have a whole bunch of fountain pens and I use this kind of ink and let them sit there for a little bit and they dry out, the cleanup is a bit of a mess. It can be a bit harsh as well too, as I said. So this has a bit less pigment mineral, so it's a bit more uh, water-based, uh, which is better for fountain pens in terms of longevity. But uh, like I said, as long as you're good about cleaning out your fountain pens, an ink like this one here is no problem. Uh, but I tend to carry like three or four fountain pens at times. Uh, questions as I'm getting here. I think it's the bottle ink first. Question is, what kind of weight of paper do you recommend with brush pens? Brush pens in general, I would say weight of paper doesn't really matter uh, because the the brush itself, being sable type, is not going to have any sort of uh, harshness to pressure under the paper. Now, of course, the heavy ink or the watery ink can, of course, buckle it. But if you're using a lot of it, that'd be one thing. But with a brush pen, you're not going to get a huge saturation of ink on the paper. So you're not going to have any sort of problems of any kind of paper, honestly. But in terms of what I would use as a recommendation, uh, honestly, for beginners, I would probably avoid heavily textured papers, things like cold press, watercolor, uh, handmade papers. Uh, I would probably even go to things like Bristol's, uh, just basic drawing papers, even like the, uh, the Strathmore 300 series sketchbook, white, gray, those are perfect. Um, those ones are relatively low in cost and available pretty much internationally anywhere. And that's a sketchbook I turn to a lot of times just for traveling as well, mainly because it's easy to carry. It comes in a large format, it's spiral bound. Uh, it's good quality paper and it's a low cost. So the Strathmore 300 series, white or gray tone, even a brown tone is really nice. So that kind of paper I would say works really good for brush pens. Uh, Thais is asking a question from all types of mediums, ballpoint, ink, graphite, which are the best for archival purposes? I would say um, anything alcohol based is not gonna do so well archivally. I think heavily pigment-based inks are really good. Uh, watercolor would be fine, but really it's more about the paper than the actual drawing medium. Uh, as long as the paper is acid-free, it won't change color, especially if it's like exposed to UVs and stuff like this. Uh, so you want acid-free papers. Now things like this kind of you know natural handmade papers, it, it could shift and change color and tone a little bit over time. For example, this particular sketchbook over here, this is a leather bound. Uh, this one I got at a, um, where was it? I think it was a Renaissance Fair, honestly. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. This was at some kind of like a craft store. To be honest, I don't even know where, who, where I got it from, and I, I don't know who made it because there's no actual branding on it. Um, so this was just, you know, this is regular leather. Uh, it's a pretty nice, it's a lot of fibers into it. It's pretty thick cut. And uh, this is a handmade paper as well, too. Now, the paper itself originally was pretty white, uh, maybe a slight cream to it. Now, this is just a leather rubbing off, okay? Uh, the paper itself, here in between, uh, is obviously a non-contact to the leather. But over time, even some of the edges, it can start to yellow a little bit. And, uh, you know, this paper has pretty, I think a lot of probably various fibers of like recycled paper, maybe, and some other things you're finding and just, you know, making it on hand. And you can kind of see how the cuts are all different. They're really rough on edges. Some of them wrinkled up a little bit. Uh, so I don't expect this paper to hold in terms of archival purposes for a long period of time. Um, it, it's not going to be unusable. You know, even if I you know have these for a long period and they start to shift color, I don't mind that. I, I like the aged, antiquish look to some pages as well. So uh, especially in terms of how some of the drawings actually you know get complemented by it. Uh, so, you know, this kind of paper, like I said, even though there are, is like this yellowing to it, I, I think it's a cool look. So um, this sketchbook in particular, I also wouldn't recommend to people who are just beginning and training, but it, you know, it has its own kind of uh, niche and purpose, I guess, behind it. And this is a straight up just hand bound. Uh, I can't tell you exactly where you can buy this mainly because again, I just found it at a random store uh, and it, it doesn't tell you who made it. So you know, 
it's a little name on the inside of your hair too, you know? So, uh, yeah. Some of these kind of books I just tend to find uh, by just going to like craft stores or in the, you know, small mom and pop shops and you'll see papers and books kind of laying about. And so I bought this one probably about two, three years ago. This was started in 2022, I want to say. Because there's a sketch in here. I think it was 2022. Yeah, if I got if I went and saw the Mustang from Utah, that was probably 2022. I thought there was a sketch in here that gave me a date. I don't even put years anymore in some of these, but <laughs> here we go. Uh, this is 2022. This is a, an older sketchbook that I just kind of put aside, and I've gone through maybe uh, close to half of the book before I put it aside. So I normally carry about uh, three or four sketchbooks, you know, my current rotation. Uh, in terms of how many books my, my current present use would be, would be these three for sure are my current rotation. And I have that larger, kind of like a, a brown tone sketchbook, is, or not a brown tone, a brown leather sketchbook that's hardcover. Uh, so I switched out for this one. So I put this one aside and got that book and I'm using that one currently. That one almost is done. So once that one finishes, I may come back to this book to finish up. Uh, so I then use about four sketchbooks in rotation and each of them have different maybe so like purposes subject and theme paper quality response uh, and also even things that I will use as materials so okay uh, let's see a couple of the questions before we start drawing the sketching here and again I'm going to be using this particular book so if that answers your question Thais as best I can uh, Big Beans is asking, when do admissions open up for my summer class? Do I even have a summer class? Well, the current class coming up starts February 12th, and that will go to about, I want to say early April-ish, mid-April when it ends. Uh, the next session of term will probably begin around mid to late May, and that goes June to maybe early July. Um, so there is a summer block. It's just not directly in the summer. It's kind of in transition. Um, so we're upcoming right now in February is our first session, and first out of four sessions total in a year. Uh, so the current session coming up, registration opens up tomorrow. So you can, if you just go to my website, peterhonstyleart.com, uh, you'll find registration information where you can actually just buy seats. You can do a live full seat to a sitting position uh, just to get the information and, and participation effects and, and a little bit of dialogue, uh, lesson plans and, and demos. Uh, but class will begin February 12th, and registration opens up tomorrow at around 10 a.m. Um, Ahmed, welcome. And a question from Ahmed is, when drawing from imagination, how can I use reference images to learn and grow while avoiding pitfalls that trap beginners when drawing from imagination like copying? What I see, um, you know, what I see you do not understand. For myself, I think in the very beginning when you're training, uh, you have to stick to those references and, and observations by looking at photographs or books or whatever images that you may have taken yourself and draw from them more directly. Now, of course, dynamic sketching, the class that I teach, is about being able to interpret those things in observation down to the base of form and structure so you can understand how to construct them in a way to also turn them in space. So, um, yes, Jason, this is the Kakimori of Mib. So uh, that's the purpose of taking classes now, of course, is building tool sets and being able to vi visualize and be more efficient onto the page and to you know, create studies or thumbnails to full renders and illustrations or whatever purpose application. Um, but that, then going into the creative side of imagination, uh, you, you need a wealth of reference and data. And the more you collect and consume that data, you have things to pull from out of your mind to be able to play with. Now that play and experimentation or exploration is a big part of being able to push that animation, imagination side. So you don't have to necessarily jump you know, off the cliff and imagine something as, as deep as you can off of a couple of different images out of your memory. It may not work so well. So having those images in front of you are probably still going to be good to have. Uh, and that can be sometimes... Um, let's say overly influential, but don't you know, deny yourself of looking at things as much as possible. Um, you know what, I wanna do a couple things first is just to test out the nib. So right now, as I've dipped it in, it's soaked in the nib, or the ink that is, in between the grooves, which you can probably barely see. Uh, I think I've probably taken a little bit more. I'm just gonna just tap it off to the side for any excess ink. Now, from the reference of collection and, and all the data of input, my suggestion then is go to artists that you find favorable when it comes to how they draw from the imagination, how they play with ideas. Um, so that way you can kind of see 
different sort of interpretations and things that you find very fascinating, uh, things you find attractive or aesthetic, and using it as a also guideline or inspiration in combination to your references and how you can play with them. So you need examples of what others can do. You need things in terms of what you've seen in reality of life. And then from there, as you play with them with a certain extent of time, you start to feel more confident on playing with things on your own. Uh, whether it's a couple of different ideas of themes, whether character base, animal base, environment base, whatever the, case, the area of interest subject matter is for you, you can then go from there. So um, let's see, let's just play with this uh, off to the corner. You know what, I'm going to zoom in a little bit for you guys, possibly. Give me a second here. Try to avoid the camera shake. My very first line <laughs> with this tool. So the point, I would say, is coming down to about a, a point three. Uh, it's at about a good 30 degree angle in terms of me drawing. It's about 90, it's about 45, I'm at about here. If I bring it to the edge and the side of it, so I can actually get a relatively broad stroke also, which is interesting. So this is me now relaxing the grip and pressing down like this. So catching that little beveled edge right on the, in the um, plane of it, that's where I'm getting that really thick kind of line. I want to try now this. So this is me dragging it down and pulling off to the side. So I'm hitting the tip and then hitting the side, bring it to the, to the uh, in a parallel kind of horizontal motion and then bringing it back up again. This is me just playing with just pressure. So these are different strokes I'm getting from just pressure play, pressing, pressing, pull, pressing, pull. Next thing I want to test is speed. So I'm going to just re-dip a little bit. Speed. That's a push action. And then pull. So these tests are to gauge several different things in terms of characteristic and personality of the nib. Uh, one, in terms of how consistent the line will be, the variation of the line, the pressure sensitivity, and the speed application in terms of how that consistent line will, will remain through variances of speed. The faster I go, will it break? And so far, this has performed very well. <laughs> uh, just from the initial impression of just the small little variances of movement, uh, I would give this an A. Now, what's the downside? Uh, you need a bottle of ink to always dip, right? So if there was like a mobile version of this with a cartridge or something like that, a converter, like a fountain pen that has a nib like this one, I actually would like this quite a bit. And because it's solid, I think it's brass as well too, solid brass, uh, it's probably going to hold the edge pretty well. Uh, now, of course, the danger of this being dropped can potentially ruin a tip, uh, and that could be pretty bad. So uh, that's something to consider. But it's very interesting so far. Like I said, for those of you that are watching, this is the first time I'm using this nib. This is a metal tip nib made by Kakimori. It's the brand, Kakimori. Uh, let's just sketch something loosely over here. Uh, this is just more of a test page, and we'll go to another page just to kind of draw more official things in a way. Um, let's see. Let me see if any questions at the moment. Dave, Sketch has a question, and um, appreciate you being here. A really honest question. How can I deal with unmotivation or, or a lack of motivation in drawing every day? I felt that when I put it in, uh, put it like a obligation, it became harder to be passionate on it. And of course, as an obligation or any sort of burden, uh, you don't see this as something that you want to just do for yourself as a personal gain. It's now something you have to do like a job. And of course, in that sense, you know, you can get very jaded of it very fast. So how do I create that sense of motivation and enticement to draw every single day and, and remain enthusiastic about it? I think a lot of it first comes down to even for initially finding uh, people. People that you, you by the way, I'm gonna draw like dinosaur stuff. I've been recently on this dinosaur kick. But it's just to kind of test it out. Um, finding people is probably gonna be your best bet uh, due to the fact that, you know, finding like-minded individuals that could be going through the same sort of difficulties you are can help, you know, kind of transition out of that. 
uh, for myself and just in this last week, you know, I was hanging out with friends and sketching and drawing, watching a movie. And you guys may have saw a post about that on social media. Um, but even after, you know, working in the industry for over 15 years, being out of school for 20, uh, this is something I still enjoy doing, hanging out with friends and drawing and sketching and just talking. Uh, for one, you know, it's that bond effect uh, where we, again, come together and we have these similar uh, interests of things and that enthusiasm, enthusiasm rubs off of each other. So that, it's a huge part of, I think, what retains that excitement of just wanting to do it every day. Now, of course, you don't get to see them every day. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's, it's a mode of um, therapy. <laughs> it's a mode of building energy and, and drive of wanting to continue to do this. Now, like I said, I don't see them all the time and I'll see them maybe once a month or so but even then that's enough to really get me going another part is for myself personally is I'm you know doing stuff like this with you guys and I get to teach classes and I have you know numbers of people I get to interact with now granted I don't see them in person but I still get to interact with people and draw with them uh, for one thing I'm drawing for them another thing I'm drawing with them because I'm using their work and drawing over their pieces and they get to kind of follow along and whatnot I'll do demos and they'll do their own versions as well too so that's another part of that kind of uh, social bonding, uh, understandably coming from more of an instructor in a class, but still there is that sort of interaction there, that human aspect to it. So that's one part that keeps me going in terms of maintaining motivation. Because I have something to, you know, uh, as a format or a platform or a location to meet up with people, knowing that I'm going to be doing stuff like this. I think another part is, is always the fact that the stuff that I create, you know, things in my sketchbooks uh, are all related to stuff in terms of, you know, what I like to draw, you know. I like to draw the turtles. I like to draw, uh, you know, um, Common Rider. I like to draw the creature of the Black Lagoon. And I like to draw, you know, different sort of animals and monsters. Uh, and, and these are the things that I just personally enjoy sketching. It's not for anything else. It's not for a job. It's not for a client. It's not for anyone but me. So because I can, and I feel comfortable and guiltless of drawing for myself because I find it enjoyable. And even though, yeah, I'll post it and it can be used as social media account sort of things but even then the social media account is me sharing my own personal endeavors and interests and lifestyle and stuff that I do and I enjoy doing so and it's very again like I said um, that part of enjoyment retains in anything that I do so of course it drives me to do more of it and I don't see this like oh, I gotta draw another page and post it up I have to draw two more pages and post it up tomorrow it's like I don't plan on stuff like that whatever I draw today I'll post it I don't plan on what I gotta draw tomorrow to post it I don't think that far ahead you know so um the, the more you have to like consider planning and strategizing and, and thinking about what I have to do for this thing as a next step and beyond, it's like it becomes, like I said, laborious and jading and hard to maintain focus on. So, of course, understandably, you know, uh, you're not going to want to do it for a long period of time. And you might have this vigor and enthusiasm for like another a week or two. But then from there, after that, you kind of run out of steam. Uh, and I'm talking about this being a sustained uh, effect where it can go for years upon years upon a decade where that 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 momentum and motivation it, it doesn't drop and uh you know like i said i've been out of school for 20 years and i've been working in the industry for 15 but let's say even in the last 10 years just in terms of just a general timeline in the last 10 years have i ever had a moment of like i don't want to draw today no has there been a moment where I, I don't really feel like creating i don't really feel like sitting down and drawing for myself and there never has been a moment like that never uh, and again, I've been teaching for over 10 years, and so there have been students that have been working with me in the last three or four. Ask them if you want to. Like, ha Has there been any sort of lack of, of uh, enthusiasm or even a, a slight change in terms of mindset and even my performance and things? A lot of students who have interacted with me can probably confidently tell you no, that I'm pretty much always on point on the things that I do with them and the things I do for myself. Um, but again, that's me. That's how I found my you know, sort of solutions and being able to sustain this. For yourself, it's going to require, you know, experimentation again, uh, exploration of the concepts, exploration of the materials, exploration of working with people and how you work with them and finding out what best fits your model uh, to maintain that involvement and motivation, right? But like I said uh, beforehand, it, as you find those key things, hopefully you can retain them and hold on to them and really appreciate them, uh, but do also allow yourself the fact that you know it, it, you're human and it, it, you can stall you can fall out of favor of things you get tired maybe you do get burnt out uh, you prioritize different things and in that you know your, your mind goes somewhere else because as it has to and that's fine um and you can always come back to it again right so so 
the pressure aspect of it, I understand, but uh, this is for yourself if you love to create. It's never going to go away permanently. It'll always be there for you when you want to come back to it. Uh, and don't feel any guilt about that. Now, if it's something related to like professional work, that's a little bit different. That's about your um, professionalism, your ability to control management of time, deadline, that kind of stuff, quality control, whatnot, uh, communication skills, social skills. Those are all different elements about what we're discussing. But still, they can relate to a degree. Um, but just think about it you know, and do the best you can. I'm going to go back up for a couple questions here. Take Beans asked, does having multiple portfolios cater to separate lines of work matter when you're just recently beginning college? Yes. Simply yes. If you're applying to several different companies or industries uh, and you have only one type of portfolio and you send that portfolio to a company that doesn't create the kind of work you're sending them, then they wouldn't look at it twice. It doesn't relate. It also shows that you don't care about the kind of products they make. So how do I then create multiple portfolios? Well, you have to create a pool of work. You know, think of it as a stable. And you pull the necessary pieces and organize that portfolio out uh, catered to that particular place. But it's still a pool of work that you're just essentially extracting uh, necessary pieces for uh, that particular job application, right? So that means you should also then continue to create uh, as much as you can, uh, always updating your work, uh, not updating a single portfolio, but updating a pool of work, right? And so that way, when a, uh, a job opening happens or an opportunity is there, you're able to net, you know, pick the necessary things real quickly, push it together in a PDF, and then send it out. Cynthia asks, when people say you need strong drawing skills for animation, what does that mean specifically? You're struggling to find concrete answer for this. Drawing skills for the animation on being specifically being able to turn form, right? Because in animation, we're talking about the idea of spatial design as well. There's optical illusion of, re of uh, movement and uh, three-dimensional space. So we can have a single image of this uh, dinosaur here, but if I'm going to animate it within space as an environment, uh, a, a, again, an optical illusion of perspective, it's got to be able to turn its form and also have context to an environment, uh, let's say a background drawing, uh, so it, it can show the three dimensions of that form, even though it's a two-dimensional drawing. So in terms of strong drawing skills, it's not about rendering. It's not about how much detail you can place in. It's about being able to take this two-dimensional image and being able to move it in space. Right? DS is saying maybe a traveling inkwell. Yeah, that's something that'd be nice to have. I mean, sometimes I'll just carry bottles like this in my bag, but I'm always a little bit afraid that something like this might crack, which actually has happened once before in the past. Uh, not the glass, but what happened was that the cap cracked on the edge right here and the ink was seeping out. And I caught it before it actually completely spilled. Uh, but man, that was like, oof, that would have been bad if it spilled in my bag like that. We're just going to be doing a, a little bit of a focal point study up into the upper portion of the torso of the animal. Um, just making up a dinosaur, honestly. This is not any specific animal. <laughs> uh, this is me just making it up. Uh, using, you know, the, the known kind of ideas of what dinosaurs can look like, different sort of theropods and whatnot. Uh, and then kind of mixing it on my own and putting a little bit of fantasy, which could we say is in just a dragon? I mean, sure. Aren't dragons essentially than that? You know, taking dinosaur skulls and seeing them as like dragons. Let's see if there are other questions here. Uh, how does my Esther book find nib do with fast and long motions? Well, it depends on the paper on the Esther books, any sort of fountain pen. I would say fountain pens, because of the way their nibs are, they're flex type. So at the ends, they'll split open. The faster you move, uh, the, the amount of flow of ink can be obstructed by that speed. So certain fountain pens will work a lot better than others. The Esther book, I would say, is pretty uh, solid, but it depends on the paper again. The rougher the paper on those kind of nib types, uh, it won't have full contact and it'll start to split. Uh, and the paper, in, well not the paper, the ink will begin to skip around. Um, so fountain pens in general, I would say, are not the most ideal kind of tool set to use within heavily textured papers. Um, but you know, then, you know, be mindful of that. Of course, you can just adjust your speed, you know. Um, and I would do so, where I would just move a little bit slower than, nor than my normal speed. Like in this movement that I have right now, uh, the fountain pen would have no problems. But this particular nib is, is performing really, really well. Uh, I'm liking it so far a lot. I keep dipping it, but I should just leave it and just see how long it goes without me having to dip the ink, uh, dip into the ink. Create the 
back leg over here. I'll make sure to keep this in frame, so I'll just check on it once in a while on the camera. <clears throat> a couple of questions. Jason got a question, which is, you got this new Raven uh, in, an, in a fine nib, and it's so smooth, but I find that I need a bit of pressure, uh, more than you're used to. Keep it from a skipping with long and fast motion. I've never used a Raven nib before. I don't particularly like nibs that require a lot of pressure. It tends to kind of cramp my hand a little bit. Uh, so I get a little bit of achiness and inflammation in the knuckles. Uh, so I prefer a little bit softer touch pens, um, things like brush pens, stuff like that, because I tend to have a soft touch and grip anyways. So anything that requires a heavy pressure tends to, over time, be hard to, it's, it can be hard to use. Um, so I'm always looking for softer nibs whenever I can. The great thing about this is that it's not flex. Like it, when I say flex, like the, the nib point is not going to spread open. Um, which will give you give me the variation of line that you would normally get in a nib or a fountain pen. So this one not having any sort of flex, it, it's all about angle, angle change, which gives me then the variation of line. Because I'm running out of paper at the bottom, so you'll notice like this is where the dinosaur is to the paper. You might be like, well, I'm going to run out of space here, so instead of that, I'm just going to put a vegetation. So that means it'll be coming out of the grass. There's always ways on being able to complete an image or sketch or illustration uh, so it can be more intentful in the way it's been framed. It's really, you know, the nib is working great in terms of movement. Right now, my, my motion tends to be a push, but I'm also going to pull this way. And the line also works just as fine, going up and down. So the line, the line produces a consistent flow no matter the direction I'm going into because of the construction of the nib. It's pretty fascinating. Like I said, this is the first time I've ever used something like this. I've seen ones that are like the glass ones. I'm sure some of you guys have seen those before too, the glass made nibs. And it's essentially the same concept as this. I never liked them though, because <laughs> they were really heavy. Uh, but this is just a nib and this is like a some kind of composite, maybe carbon, I'm not sure, or paper, micarta. This is smooth and super lightweight. So it's a little bit front heavy, like the balance point. It's probably right about there. Yeah. <clears throat> Another question over here is, I've been practicing drawing from imagination for a year. Using only pigment ink liners, do you plant your scene in advance and refine them or your approach more spontaneous? Both. Sometimes I plan things. When I, when I say plan, what does that mean? Do I think about it and do I sketch it? Do I thumbnail? Sure. Uh, for certain pieces that need that uh, and what pieces will need them maybe for client work commission stuff something that people need to see beforehand before i finish it if it's personal i don't necessarily have to uh, you know plan on what it needs to be i just kind of go with spontaneously in there like a dinosaur like this one here you know i draw on similar types of images not exactly this image but similar types like them um in various poses and angles and whatnot so it's comfortable for me to draw this i don't think about what to do in terms of what the pose is or what the and that is going to do with a line, all that stuff is just going to be playing with it. Okay, so now, right now the ink has stopped working. So I still see a little bit of stuff in between, but that's probably just the residue. Right now there's no ink laying out. So that was a pretty good amount of time used without having to dip. And stuff like this makes it easy to clean. And like I said, the only downside, of course, is carrying a bottle of ink. Um, but in terms of the cleaning action of it will be much simpler than a fountain pen because the fountain pen has so many you know uh, systems internally that you can break it apart but anything that goes off on it or wrong on it it can hinder the performance of a fountain pen which is one of the downsides for myself uh, that i've experienced in fountain pens in the past where it just sometimes they don't really run as smoothly and they work great in the beginning but then over time they kind of degrade um, and it can just be sometimes the ink that you're using or because you're not very good about cleaning it all the time. And, you know, I'm not perfect with them. Uh, so sometimes it can, like I said, behave poorly. Uh, Dave Sketch had a follow-up, which is... Uh, 
yeah, so you like to put the streams on to just draw. Uh, if you like to hang out with people that you who share the same passions, different ways instead of drawing because they have to. Yeah, exactly. So while you guys are here, as I'm talking and answering questions, interacting with people, as you're also discussing things with me, you could be sketching. You know, I'm drawing a dinosaur. It's not that difficult to just get started drawing a dinosaur of your own version. Uh, so sit and draw, hang out. Big Bean is saying you're currently trying to dive into perspective. What would you say are the chronological building blocks for perspective? I'm doing. I find just doing one point and two point, three point is useless and robotic. Well, it's not useless um, because it's obviously you know the application of it is directly infused into developing scenes that have that optical illusion of depth. Uh, but it's all about what it's being applied for. You know, if it's an illustration of a location of a scene of a, of a city block, then yeah. The perspective becomes very applicable if it's talking about let's say uh, organic landscapes like forest scenes and stuff like this sometimes you kind of eye your perspective but perspective is more than just converging of lines you know perspective is also about scale front to back you know things about uh overlap you know things about the the uh the clarity or density of image you know you have a lot more image to the foreground less to the background so that atmospheric perspective might even be there too so perspective is more than just convergence of things but that's definitely one of the constructive parts we use, especially in scenes or objects that have, you know, um, forms that are easily transferable as base blocks. That's something organic, you know, you would still be able to use it. Uh, but for myself, I don't necessarily use those rules down to the point where I'm going to set up a whole horizon line and vanishing point and lines as a construction. But I'm going to be able to project it, uh, project it onto the page through my own visualization. But those, you know, uh, methods are still tried and true. And uh, they can be monotonous, they can be boring, that's a little bit different. That's just because it's such a technical thing. But it is very useful. Um, Geronimo, uh, welcome from France. Can you, share with us, can you share with us when and why you decided to teach? Well, I mean, that story, um, I'm sure I've, I've spoken on it several times on live streams. And people know of it in general who know me. Uh, but for those who don't, uh, it, teaching kind of fell in my lap. <clears throat> it wasn't something I was planning to do. I can say that when I was younger in college, that I was probably be, be, being, being, uh, let's say, groomed for it. And this is due to my mentor. My mentor, Norm Sherman. And you can just Google him. You'll find the website, all about information about him. Uh, he was killed uh, in 2010, uh, tragically. And uh, I was very close with him, his family, all that sort of stuff, and still am today with his family. Um, but in 2010, when he passed away, I was still living in San Diego and working full time in the game industry, as a concept artist. And I was in a concept artist uh, field working in, in full time around maybe up to about seven years before I left. Uh, but in 2010, you know, before he passed away, I got my first teaching opportunity uh, at a school here in Pasadena called the Concept Design Academy. And I was recommended from a friend of mine from Art Center uh, who happened to teach there back at the time. And his name was Rodney, Rodney Fontabella. And he's a Marvel uh, Viz Dev artist, Cinematics. Great crew, great dude out there. Uh, and so the, the operator of CDA reached out to me asking if I would teach a class. Now at the time, in 2010, dynamic sketching is what I'm kind of known for in teaching. Uh, didn't exist out of Art Center. and was not taught by anyone else except by Norm. Uh, so Norm was the one that instructed many, many, you know, hundreds and thousands of people uh, out there in different industries, and especially in our field of entertainment design. Uh, Norm is known within my generation. So uh, w when he when he was around and I got the offer to teach, this is in January of 2010. I reached out to Norm because you know we ch chatted all the time, and I asked him, "Would it be okay if I taught this class that you teach outside of our center?" Because no one did at the time. And he was all for it, absolutely. Uh, you know, we had talked about teaching together for, for several years before that. Uh, so I took it, you know, that, that idea and, and I would drive up to L.A. every weekend. So I lived in San Diego, drive up two hours every weekend to go teach in L.A. And this happened for that uh, three-month period, January to March. So March is when he passed. Uh, he was killed there on that time. Um, so when he, when he was gone, Art Center, the college in Pasadena that I went to and that he taught at, uh, came to me and asked if I would continue what he was teaching because they, they knew about, you know, uh, me being so closely, closely related to the class and, and to Norm. And so they came to me asking if I would continue. I'm not going to go into a bit of darks now, okay? Uh, 
uh, let me zoom in a bit more in this specific area so you can kind of see more what the line looks like in a minute. Sorry for the shake, it'll go still. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, I was around 28 around that time, and I was working full time in San Diego. And Art Center was in Pasadena, and uh, they asked if I would teach. And I only just started teaching at CDA that year, but I couldn't say no. Um, as I said, it all fell on my lap at one time. So I couldn't say no. I said yes, I'll start in February of that year. Around that time, uh, an online school called CGMA had also begun. And uh, I was closely connected to that school because I started with them. And they asked me to continue the classes there as well too there. So I started teaching online. So in that 2010 year, three different schools uh, all dropped on my lap at one time. One due to an unfortunate means of my mentor passing away, uh, an art center coming to me and being as young as I am and, and with the amount of experience, little experience of teaching that I had, I wasn't confident, but again, I couldn't say no. So I took it and, and I you know, said I would try it. Uh, CDA began and then also CGMA all began. So in that year while I was working full time, I took three classes. Uh, so starting in 2010, I began my teaching career, uh, teaching dynamic sketching primarily. And at Art Center, it wasn't under entertainment. It was actually for our product design department. Uh, that's where I taught at Art Center for the first couple of years. And from then on, time just passed by. Uh, and since then, the 2010 year of teaching in January, uh, till now, you know, after 13 years, uh, I have not missed, actually more like 14 years, I have not missed a single class. I have not missed a single term. I've been teaching straight since 2010 uh, at most of these schools. Now, today, I don't really teach at those places. I, I run my own school now online. So uh, around 2020, when all that craziness happened with COVID, uh, it kind of forced my hand to start my own thing, which I already had done, but uh, it forced me to like leave all the other places because they all shut down. And I just kind of ran my own classes online and never looked back. So at this point, in the last three years, I've been running my own school uh, online, and, and it's been pretty much my main priority. Uh, so yeah, 2010 is when it began. But uh, it was, again, like I said, due to unfortunate, tragic means of my initial beginnings, teaching college level. Uh, but that unfortunate outcome, you know, for me, of course, I look back, and, and that was the way it was supposed to happen for me to continue the way it did. Uh, and I still, to this day, when I teach, always recognize and tell people the origins of this class, where it came from, and the mentor and teacher that I had. Uh, and there are many people out there that teach basic sketching classes like dynamic sketching at other schools. But, you know, a lot of them are going to be students of mine, or they're going to be students of Norm. Um, and, you know, at this point, I will continue doing this for as long as I can uh, until, you know, maybe people have less interest in it and, and, you know, something else comes into play or I decide to do something else. Um, but at this point, it seems like this is pretty much my my calling and uh, what is I'll probably stick with for the lifetime of <laughs> things. So that's pretty much the story of it. More appreciate the comment about uh, having a good time in the class. Uh, could I do a demo on approaching environment studies? Well, maybe. Uh, and, and, you know, I'd have to do like a whole lesson plan for something like that for a demo, which for a live stream on YouTube is probably not the most appropriate unless I set it up that way. Uh, maybe next time. But um, I don't necessarily mind doing environments. You know, I like drawing location stuff, especially architecturally, you know, on location when I'm traveling and whatnot. I carry a sketchbook and draw places. Um, so that kind of stuff is, is something I can do. It's just that, you know, I think it requires... Uh, you know, things like reference images to kind of see what I'm actually looking at, how I interpret it, not because I need it, but because when people observe when, he, when I draw that kind of stuff, having a context of what I'm actually drawing really helps, you know. If I just make it up on the spot, I mean, that's great. It can look visually nice, but uh, it, it's going to be such a technical or more of an educational format of discussion that it, it can be nice to sit through. But for people that are coming on YouTube, you know, like, and some people are going to be very untrained on things or they just hear it as hobbyists and so trying to maintain the tension is not going to be that easy when it comes to subject matter and something like that, maybe. I don't know. I could be wrong. But um, in terms of a good you know, instructor and artist that primarily focuses on exterior and environment, I would turn to Aaron, Aaron Lamonic. Uh, you'll find him on his Instagram, Aaron Lamonic, and he does mostly a lot of demos 
on environmental things. That's really his key area. So if you're looking more for that kind of demo more directly right now, uh, go to his stuff over there. So Fire by Dragon's asking, how do I draw from my imagination? Well, something like this is pulled from many sort of things, of observations of dinosaur skeletal structures when I was a kid and when I was also as I got older. I would draw from observation, uh, going to museums a lot. And then, of course, I would look at actual animals, you know, crocodiles, the reptiles, the birds, and of course, as well. And then from there, looking at the real world, I would look at imagined things from fantasy stuff that artists already would draw on themselves. And then finding the inspiration about style and, and application and mediums and storytelling that they would all do. And the culmination of all that time compression, uh, you know, of let's say 20 plus years of doing it, <laughs> is, is where the, uh, the, the easiness, the effortlessness comes through. But how can you do it? Based on what I started with. Draw from your observation. Draw from life. Study the real things. Uh, find interest in those areas. Research them. Read about them. Find out what they do and how they work and where they come from. Uh, travel. You know, see them in the real world. Uh, and then from there, build up your sketchbook skill set. Drawing skill set, line, composition, value, um, render, surface, you know, that sort of stuff. All those sort of things within artistic techniques that we all need to have as a standard. And then from there, with a sense of confidence built up over time, uh, hopefully the sure-footedness will be there and the efficiency that I also have as well too. And even then, knowing that there's still a lot of room to grow. And I'm not the best, uh, but I'm confident in what I can do. Uh, Trey Bart is asking, where can you find a link to my school? You just go to my website, peterhanstyleart.com. <clears throat> Solo asking, is it possible to make a living if only uh, knowing digital portrait painting? What is the smartest way to make money as a beginner? Uh, I don't know. In, in terms of, can you make a living off of a port as a portrait artist? Because I am not a portrait artist. Could there be artists out there that primarily just do portrait and make a relatively good living? Sure. Out of the millions possibly billions of artists that are out there are there going to be a certain number of, of them that can do them very well and, and make a good living probably um how can you as a beginner start in that route i mean of course when it comes to portrait painting i would say a big part of it is networking right finding a, a an audience uh a, a grouping of people that tend to favor your work so how do i get your work out there well of course you got to start building a notoriety within a reputation of your work so that means you generate a lot of stuff Getting your stuff out there, best thing to do is go on social media, right? Uh, start doing things like gallery shows if you can. But you're saying, I'm just a beginner. How do I get all that stuff? Well, your skill has to be built up. So being confident in just your skills initially, painting, you know, drawing, value, color, composition again, uh, all the traditional means, even digital means. Traditional is something you should explore while you also do digital. digital. Uh, without those traditional skills, you know, like I said, some of those things don't really trend or um, some of those things can be really picked up efficiently and really well on digital. Uh, traditional skills still really help on building digital skill sets. So I would even go to that as much as I can too. Um, but like I said, then that's just time. Uh, but if you say, well, I don't really have time. I'm going to give myself two years to learn and, and to become a really good portrait artist. Good luck. You know, do I think you can make it in two years time? Personally, in my opinion, no. Uh, I think for any artist designer trying to train themselves professionally from the very beginning at the, at the foundations in a two year period to get professional levels is impossible. But I'm not going to say it's 0% chance. So impossible is not the right word. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's not in your favor. But is the potential there? If the drive is there, you know, if your quality of work does sustain and build and evolve over time, sure, it could be possible. But it's hard to say, you know. So I just scroll up a little bit, missed a bunch of questions again. Um, sorry, there's a couple of questions I have to pass through. I have to get down to the bottom of the chat window. So if I don't answer your question, you can ask again uh, at the bottom end of it. So I'll, I'll look at it over. Um, besides using perspective, how do you make a drawing more interesting? A lot of the time I feel like a subject is just posing when I draw and it's quite boring. Storytelling helps the most. You know, it's like if you don't have your own stories, do your takes on them. What's the best place to go to like short story wise? It could be things like folklore, mythology is a great place. Scenarios and scenes, interaction, right? If you have a single character, a single object, a single theme, and it's just sitting there posing, then obviously it's just a study of the actual visual nature. It's just a dinosaur standing there. But 
if I had the dinosaur being attacked, or maybe it's raising its young, or it's trying to find um, you know safety, if it's running from something, there's more storytelling there. And even though it's an animal, it doesn't have a person like a, it doesn't have like a, a dialogue or characteristic on a human social level or or culture level. Uh, I can still incorporate this idea of you know the general basics of of organisms on our planet in terms of what they do to sustain life, right? Uh, or how to survive. So stuff like that can be dramatic, right? So then I would watch things like documentaries of animals. What do they do? I'm going to use animals like this one here that I'm imagining fantasizing on uh, and, and study the real, real world and generate that kind of imagery. So I think a lot of that comes again to the idea of storytelling and how we as humans interpret that. And even though it's happening in the world around us as animals or nature things, uh, we tend to project our emotions and our interactions and our relatability of stuff as human cultures into them. Um, so we feel sorry for animals or we feel happy for them. Or we feel, you know, we find them cute or we find them uh, chaotic or we find them threatening or what are the cases. And those things are very true in that sense and what they are. Um, but still in terms of generating an image that is fascinating, uh, usually those are the things you want to think about. But there's also nothing wrong with doing a sketch or a drawing of an animal just standing there because they can also just stand there. Yeah. Uh, Dara was asking, how do I spell uh, Aaron's last name? Um, I'll put it in the chat uh, once I get to the bottom of it, right? Thanks, Remy. Appreciate that. War is asking, I have a point, where, point of study where counting proportions shape relationships. Do you do this with everything? Like when you draw a dinosaur like this, do you count proportions in the same way? No, I don't. Uh, can you? Probably. But are there systems built for that? Meaning, if we draw people, right, you can find and research many different systems or techniques that have been developed over the many generations of artistic approach. Whether it's the Riley technique or the Loomis technique or the Bridgman technique or whatever the case might be. Uh, even creating your own hybrid systems. There's always some system because we use the human figure so often. So trying to find the efficiency and ways on, on developing that is, you know, a, a large part of why you can find so many of those things. And it's not to say that people don't draw dinosaurs, but are they as popular or as heavily researched or, or studied compared to the human figure in history? I mean, no, in my opinion. So how many actual systems are there and how to draw and, and construct dinosaurs? Very little, if not none, right? But can we use systems of how we draw animals, which there can be a bit more of, everyday modern-day animals of uh, herbivores or predators or birds or whatever the case is? Sure. And I can use those same systems that can also be, then be relatable to human figure stuff. So maybe I can use a head count, go one, two, well, how many head counts are a dinosaur? I don't know. <laughs> you know? And it can vary. Because when we're talking about dinosaurs, we're not talking about just one type. Because when we talk about a human being, we talk about the archetypes of a male and a female figure. And we can use those as an archetype to apply them to the everyday people or specific people that we have in front of us, whoever they are, wherever they come from, or whatever they may be. Um, we can still use the archetype to, as a blueprint to then manipulate, morph, or alter proportion to fit to that person specifically. But in a dinosaur, if I said, okay, specifically of this theropod dinosaur, bipedal, predatorial. Okay, then that one system applied to that one dinosaur, but we have many others, sauropods, and, you know, horned dinosaurs, or you know, whatever the case may be, right? So then you would need to have different counting systems for all of them. I mean, you can create that if you want to, but uh, so then what do I do? You know, I, I tend to, you know, like I said, still look for shape and form and what I done with animal studies in the past and experience doesn't require me to build them as much anymore. But in terms of the beginning of training, you know, I'm still going to use those animal type systems of drawing and even human figure type drawing systems as a way to estimate my way through it. And the fact of the matter is, is that I'm not necessarily drawing a real dinosaur. And even the bone structures that are out there, are, you know, I mean, it, it's not going to be necessarily a one-to-one -to, -one to the way the animal actually looked proportionally. You know, it, it, all we can really do is just estimate due to fossilized bones being changed due to either compression or, you know, based on pressure from, from the sediments and stuff like that. Bone changes, turns a rock. Uh, but even then, a lot of dinosaur skeletons aren't even 100% complete. A lot of them are 30% complete, 40% complete. The most complete dinosaurs out there may be 70, 80% complete. So how we even construct them anatomically, I mean, it's only in the recent modern day age we start to figure that stuff out. But back in like the 1900s, you know, we erected them very kind of vertical, like Godzilla, you know? Uh, so 
with new information and new research, you know, it changes our understanding of that area. But in that situation there, I'm talking specifically about dinosaurs, but let's just say even just with animals, you know, are there systems that we can use for counting? I mean, again, like I said, you probably can hybrid those things together, but it takes your work to find it. Jack saying your three-year-old can draw circles. That's awesome. It starts there. Muscle memory training. Can't start too young, actually. Actually, that's the thing about it, too, is that uh, kids nowadays are starting younger and younger in terms of more of a formatted training, uh, that their abilities and skills, by the time they get to you know um, their teenage years and their 20s, and they're, when they get to the point of age when they start getting interested in working in the field, uh, their levels of technique are going to be far greater than, than us. Um, you know, For me, drawing wasn't such a technical drawing system method when I was taught when I was younger. I wasn't taught. I was just let alone to draw my own. So I was just playing around. Uh, it didn't become format until I became, you know, got into like high school and the college. And I was in my teens and 20s at the time, you know. Uh, thank you for sharing the name, Thais. It's Aaron Lamonic. That's right. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. There's comments that said questions. Um, Big Bean sent another question here regarding portfolios. Do you have any recommendations for what websites to use for online portfolios? Um, good question. If anybody has any recommendations, please share. I think, you know, in the past, when the, in the recent time, people would have gone to ArtStation. But ArtStation right now is kind of in a controversial mode <laughs> due to all the AI stuff. Uh, so I, I can't necessarily just recommend that place anymore. But um I still have an art station. I don't really. I never really use it to begin with. But uh, it, for myself, I would suggest you just build your own website. You know, go to Squarespace. You know, purchase your own. Um, yeah, just get your own web hosting. Build a simple website from there. Post your portfolio on that. Because you know the website that I have is just Squarespace. And I would keep all my archive stuff on there primarily. So that's probably what I would use. Mr. Grinch is asking any advice on how to simplify my two years of life drawing class. Every character I draw is correct from an anatomy standpoint, but how do I dumb it down so my girl characters aren't always buff? <laughs> uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having the buff girl characters, but I guess if that's the only thing you draw, you want more diversity, right? In terms of your character types, uh, as you design things potentially into the future. Um, I mean, in terms of any advice I can give to that, in terms of simplification, uh, Looking at other artists in terms of how they interpret is probably going to be the best thing. To follow by example really is going to be the key. Uh, could you come across that sort of, I guess, understanding through spontaneous action of just investing time? Probably. Is, is there a guarantee of how much time that would take to find that? Probably not. Uh, or definitely not. But, you know, looking at others and, and standing on their shoulders and seeing how they take it to those stages of understanding will, will give you a guideline. It'll give you a path that you can kind of follow, but from there also kind of burn your own version of it as you kind of navigate through. Uh, so I wouldn't shy away from looking at additional artists' work. And I understand that you kind of want to find your thing. Uh, it, we can simply say something like, you know, your method, your construction, your style, quote unquote. Those sort of things, you know, like it sounds like you just have to kind of discover them spontaneously, right? And that's a part of it. Just natural drawing and activity every day will help you come across ideas or, or moments of, aha, a light bulb going off. But like I said, I think for most artists, uh, the common method of approach in terms of being able to find solutions to certain problems they run into are turning to other people. You know, and That could be artists of our contemporaries or historical or ancestral kind of like, you know, uh, pieces of art. Um, peers, instructors, classes, right? Because those are the environments and those are the kind of visual things you need to stimulate that mind of awareness. Question from uh, Bardas. Is any books or exercises to study design and incorporating it into animal drawing? Um, design like creature design? If we're talking about animal construction drawing, I mean, everyone's going to know Joe. Joe Weatherly, you know, and he has a pretty good formatted book out there. Uh, a lot of the, the designers that I know within my generation would have all looked at Joe Weatherly at the time. Um, so he has a, a couple of good books out there you know, that go into animal construction. Another uh, friend of mine, instructor named Gary Garath, 
Gary, G-A-R-Y, uh, G-E-R-A-T-H, Garath, has an uh, instructional booklet as well, too. He teaches at, I think, Laguna now still. I'm not sure. Um, he's not going to be as, uh, maybe not as widespread, because he tends to keep his, his lessons in in-person classes, not as vocal online. Uh, I'm not sure about how vocal Joe Weatherly is either, too, but most of us when we were students knew about Joe. Sorry, just going to do more questions here. Uh, Ivan is a uh, reading from Germany. Could you recommend us two or three art books you find very inspiring? Hmm. Let's see, two. Two art books. And inspiring is different than educational. Uh, inspiring, I'll, I'll list one, which is one I mentioned earlier in one of my classes. Uh, it happens to be a concept art book of the film District 9. I think that's one of the best concept art books from production, in my opinion. I think it's really well designed. I think it really gives a good amount of information. Most concept art books from productions, let's say like games or animations or movies, are more like coffee art books. They look great, but they're not really that informative, you know? Uh, but I found the District 9 art book to be actually quite stunning. So I would suggest that one first. Second, <clears throat> I don't want to list my own books. So let's say something outside of my own books. Um, one that I would turn to. I'm trying to think of one I was maybe when I was a bit younger of what I would turn to all the time. Uh, for myself, it was always going to be back in like 2008. The, the Japanese artist Tarada was the guy I turned to the most that I looked at uh, for his drawing books. So he used to produce those thousand page sketchbooks, um, and, and it was so prolific. And, and the guy is still such a beast today, uh, Katsuya Tarada, T E R A D A. And uh, Tarada, his books are really wide, you know, widely well known. He's still very active now. Um, and you know, for him, his main inspiration was Mobius, but Mobius doesn't really have, I mean, he has a lot of art books and comics and I love his collections, but I would love to see like a sketchbook from Mobius, you know, cause most of Mobius's works were always like these pieces that were in, in graphic novels or marketable pieces and illustrations and whatnot. And we could say maybe there are sketchbooks, but they're so, you know, maybe the way he draws is maybe that way. But you know, some of the Tarada's books as sketchbooks are always really fascinating to me because Sketchbooks to me are more uh, of being able to peer into the mind of the person, how they think, how they observe, how they draw, how they construct. Uh, and it can still look clean or rough or it doesn't re really matter about the outcome of the piece in terms of finish, but more in terms of knowing the fact that these sketches were being used as a, as a way to explore an idea or to study or to practice something. Uh, that's what I love sketchbooks for because it gives you, again, an insight to the person. So any Katsuya Tarada sketchbook is, is a great one. Um, if there was a sketchbook like that from Mobius, I would say, yeah, I would, I would pick that up in a heartbeat. Just going through hatching a little bit. Let me zoom out slightly. So you can kind of see it the way. This is from probably about the distance of how much I'm looking at it. We're going to keep the underside a little bit light. Again, I'm going to focus this top area just a bit more. I'm going to punch in a couple of cast shadow darks in some of these areas. Um, group some things together. I'm probably going to work on this for about another, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 minutes at the most. And then we'll move on and do something else. We'll do one more drawing. Uh, I don't know how complete I'll get to it, but I just want to keep playing with this nib. And uh, we'll see how far I get to this uh, screen. We're about an hour and 12 minutes in right now. Uh, I don't plan to go for a full extent, like two and a half hours today. Uh, I will come back and do so uh, probably next week. This week right now is the, the uh, end of my classes. So once we finish up here, registration opens up tomorrow. Um, classes don't begin until February 12th. But in between that time, I'm going to have a lot of you know, uh, excess time to be able to just come on live stream uh, and go on YouTube with you guys. So you'll be able to join in, hopefully, uh, I would say once or twice a week, starting next week. And I'll probably go a lot longer in those sessions. Uh, probably, you know, the standard two, two and a half hours uh, that I normally do. And thankfully, the, the YouTube channel has, even though with limited uh, engagement or limited content going up, um, I still see numbers going up, subscribers and stuff like that. And we're hitting, you know what, 53,000 subscribers right now, which is... Uh, more than I ever expected to actually grow with no activity, <laughs> you know. Um, 
so that's kind of surprising and, and, and a very welcome surprise because my Instagram is like stalled. It's like there's no growth on it at all. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to see that there's at least one pro, uh, platform that I enjoy working with uh, that's still showing growth and interaction. <clears throat> so Jack Burton's asking about how do you think Frank Rosetta learned to draw? Probably a lot of traditional skills, much like how we did with standard you know, classical artists and whatnot. I don't exactly remember his classical training or his educational training that is. Now, I've watched the, the Frank Frazetta documentary and, and I've looked into his work quite a bit. I love his work a lot. Uh, but in terms of his, you know, me remembering his educational background, I don't really remember. Um, but I'm sure he was like, you know, trained classically, but used those classical techniques into his own endeavors, uh, which is why a lot of traditionalists back in the time was not a big fan of Frazetta. It was all like fantasy work and whatnot. So true, you know, fine artists looked down at his work as being like comic book kind of, you know, kid stuff in a way. Um, he wasn't seen as high level or, or prolific level of artists. But today, of course, you know, everybody looks at Frank Frazetta at a higher regard. Uh, but back then, I, I don't think it was the case. But for me, I think for him, the, the thing that stood out, which I think, in most cases, when I look at people as artists, uh, the thing that, that pops out the most to me is not necessarily what their work is, but it's themselves. And Frank, you know, much like other people that I tend to respect, has a quality about them, which is this insatiable hunger and drive to create and generate work. And nothing stands in their way, you know? And, and with Frank, I'm sure you guys know that story about him, you know, having gone through a stroke and he lost his ability to draw with his right hand. He was shaking a lot. So he learned with his left and nothing could stop him. Uh, that, that intensity of energy is something that is very attractive. You know, people can say it's maybe confidence, but not necessarily. I'm sure it's scary, you know, to go through something like that. Um, but that drive is just intoxicating. And that's the kind of drive that I want to be able to sustain for myself and, and prolong it and keep it for the rest of my being. Uh, and I think that's, what, that's what's going to keep me going in a long-term sense, right? This absolute intensive drive and hunger. How do you stimulate that and how do you grow it? I mean, a lot of it, I think, is, is finding, um, like I mentioned earlier, people uh, to create that continued establishment of support system, uh, encouragement that gives you the, the positive energy to keep going. But it's also very internal. You know, I think it's also very much uh, developed from the inside of the person. And I think even sometimes a bit of a natural wiring in the brain, um, how you perceive the world and how you perceive yourself. And again, having confidence in you can be hard to find for some people, you know, but you got to find it some way. However, that is, you know, whether through education or whether through your own personal accomplishments or other, other people itself, uh, you got to find something like that, that personal confidence that I think bleeds into the things you're talking about. Sky Golden, welcome from Italy. Pat the tank, not a problem. Appreciate your comment. And uh, any sort of support for the uh, YouTube stream is always welcome, you guys. I appreciate it. Subscribe, please. Um, whatever you can, share it. <laughs> um, she was asking, you said before that you don't necessarily have a preference in subject matter and instead simply love the act of drawing. Any tip for developing this mindset as a beginner artist? I think certain classes that expose you to, to a method of technique on how to uh, capture or to express, uh, to be able to understand a method of approach is what's going to do this for you. And that was dynamic sketching for me. Because when I was younger in Art Center, I primarily focused on human form. I barely drew animals and I barely drew vehicles and I drew them at times, but it wasn't my go-to. I preferred, I had a preference for just the human figure at that time in my early 20s. So after taking down a sketching, that class opened my eyes to understand how to perceive shape and form through anything that's out there. Because, you know, I think when you're, when you're classically trained through illustration methods or technique, you're only using the human figure as a standard or as a, as a subject matter to see the ways of how those approaches can be applied. But those applications and methods can be applied anywhere. But until you actually see it being done and you, you have a chance in an environment for you to explore that and to try and make those connections, you're never going to find them. So once I was placed in a class like that, and I had then a chance, the opportunity to do such a thing, um, it, it clicked. Again, like I said, it opened my eyes. Um, and today, again, like I said, 
people even ask simply like, you know, can I use these systems of what you teach to draw a human figure? Of course you can, and vice versa. Because somebody even asked like, can I use a counting system for drawing a dinosaur like a human head? Sure, it's not gonna be the same standards. It's not gonna be the same for all the other dinosaurs, but could you use a similar outcome or approach to that for something like this? I don't see why not. But now it takes your time of, of exploration and attempt and experimentation to see how well it does. Uh, and you might need to hybrid several other systems. But I think it's very doable. You know, Jason is saying it, you know, as an artist and, and um, business owner, do you have any advice for switching gears and balancing the time between your art and other topics and activities that you that are necessary for your business? <clears throat> I mean, uh, patience is one thing. Embracing the fact that you're not going to be able to get to those expected levels uh, due to the fact that all the different priorities exist for you, right? So don't put necessarily a strong timestamp as to when you need to be able to accomplish, uh, let's say, learning certain systems or techniques and, and qualities in your art uh, or whatever application it may go to. Simply said and done, though, right? Having the patience and the discipline and time and, and the, the uh, consistency of it. Because you may not be able to, let's say, invest the amount of hours you want to or to produce as many pieces as you want to. But consistency is important. Even if you, even if you are only drawing, let's say, a couple hours you know, every other day, or even less than that, you know, maybe you're only drawing 20, 30 minutes a day or less than that, but are you still consistent? The consistency over time will show fruition of that action, right? But if you're inconsistent and you have blocks of times a week where you're not doing anything at all because your priority got shifted over to your business, well, then that side suffers and vice versa. You know, you can be practicing training, drawing, but if you have a business and that's suffering because you're not putting the time into it, it's not a balance. So, um, of course, it's your responsibility to find what that balance is because of your life circumstances, your life circumstances, whether you have family or other responsibilities, pets, maybe it's something too, whatever that may be. Um, and, and, you know, as I said, the expectation is, is a hard thing to let go of uh, because you are responsible for potentially all those things. That is your life and you have chosen those routes. So as much as you'd like to be with just only an artist all day. Well, you know, you can't just make that jump automatically and nor is it wise just to cut off all those other things and go to that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you can't eventually transition fully into this thing and eventually maybe like, you know, take your business elsewhere and maybe sell it off or close it down and, and have a success in something else in art, right? But time, patience. And of course, I can understand people are thinking like, but I'm older, you know, I'm like in my 40s uh, or 50s or whatever. It's like, well, you know, you have to have a different concept of what it is when it comes to like art and being a professional for you, you know? If it's about working in the industry at a studio, there's no too late for that. If you're saying, well, I want to start my own like art business, you know, and have a conglomerate, and, <laughs> I don't know, some kind of uh, industry focus on being able to generate um, art that I can sell as prints or products or something like this. It's like, well, I mean, I, I guess you can do that when you're older too, but trying to establish like a a strong brand i don't look i don't think it's too late either too but still uh, you know certain endeavors i think require a certain amount of time to build you know a reputation or a imprint or footprint that people can come to can it happen in a short amount of time sure for some people but for the general most of us it's probably going to take a lot longer you know so when you do start naturally at an older age um it's kind of you know against you not impossible but still going to be uphill battle as all things kind of are but still uh it doesn't help but like i said working in the industry that's different because there's an established corporate company there and that's you just being an employee uh, and that's just not bringing your skills and if you're only focusing on building your skills there's no age limit for that in my opinion people who are living it might feel otherwise you know um because I started when I was very young. So obviously because I haven't lived it and I'm not living it now, you know, this is just only based on observation of working with people in the, of that age. Uh, but for those of you that are actually going through it, this is where of course you share your experiences and maybe give your own advice and, and whatnot. And I think coming together as a community and, and helping each other is really then the way to move forward. Rico, thank you. Welcome from France again. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to scroll a little bit further down. So I'm going to move my mic because it apparently it's a bit low. So 
I think it's because of my head pointing down right now. So let me just shift my mic down a little bit more. <clears throat> Hopefully that's a bit better. Philippe, hey, welcome. Just finished the dynamic sketching class this Tuesday. Love the class. Thank you again for being there. Uh, appreciate your time and effort and investment to it. And hopefully you have more um, engagements with us in the future with other classes. Again, this is going to be the last maybe couple minutes working on this piece, and then we're going to move on. I just wanted to test out some of the darker mark making and whatnot. And so far, the paper is holding up really well. I'm liking it. The pen, the nib is working really nicely. Um, I'll probably end up keep using this for a little bit. What I need to get now is some kind of like folder or case. Uh, hold on one second. I also got some paper towel here so I can use this to kind of wipe off some excess ink. Because you can start to kind of, I can feel it drying on the surface and I kind of want to just take off some excess. Uh, Vico, I think, is asking then, how do you find how to find the confidence to draw from imagination when you are a student, beginner, and especially the breakaway from the references? I, I don't know what you mean. And, and again, we've talked about this already today uh, to a certain degree. And I, I welcome the continued question of it because this is obviously a large interest for many beginners when it comes to the world of, of education within art. This idea that you feel hindered or you feel, let's say, less than in terms of your abilities if you're unable to break away from the references, which the assumption is that many professionals don't need to seem to need references. They can just draw out of their mind only, and that's what is required to be labeled as a professional, is not having your ability to draw out of your mind as I'm doing so. Um, it, it, it's just a skill that's built up naturally over time. I think many artists who are able to create or work in the industry professionally are going to be able to do this. Draw from the imagination out of their heads without references. Okay, uh, But it doesn't mean that professionals are going to avoid using references entirely and, and that it's not a crutch of any type because it's so necessary for you to do so. Um, so even now, it's like, you know, will I use references? Of course I will. Absolutely. You know, even this drawing in here, in this sketchbook, uh, if I turn to, let's say, the beginning of the page, this is from reference. I didn't make this up. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't draw from out of my head or memory. This is from a reference photograph that I took, you know, of a, of a Cape Buffalo in, Africa, in uh, Kenya. This is from observation. It's not from a photograph, but I'm literally looking at it, you know, in the Maasai Mara sitting at the you know edge and just drawing it from observation. Uh, this is from a photograph that I took. Many of the studies that I'll do are going to be coming from reference. But does that mean that I'm not that I'm not going to be able to draw some of these animals out of my own mind? Of course not. This giraffe was drawn in combination of observation by looking at the animal in person and then drawing out of it, uh, the rest of it out of my memory. Because I'm not sitting there drawing this entire thing in one sitting. I'll start it and then we'll go somewhere else. And I'll come back to this page and finish it up because I can generally understand what a giraffe looks like. You know, These are all from observations or referencing photographs because I took them. This is from a photograph that I took of you know a friend out in Kenya. This is from a photograph that I took from a reference that I you know, took a photograph of. These are from live observation, being in the truck. You know, So these images and drawings are all from things that I'm looking at as a reference. And I'm not going to shy away from it, and nor am I going to say, oh, I drew this out of my own memory. To kind of hold that as a badge by saying, you know, you, I'm at a certain level, you know, of, of a position or status that, hey, others that can't do this are less than, is not the way you should consider it. And I'm not saying this is what Vico's asking, by the way. I'm just saying as a general sense of a whole uh, of the perceptions of what people are, are should be capable of doing and what they should be doing to be labeled as a professional, right? Uh, as a student, I understand that assumptions, especially when you look at social media, can be very confusing. Because on social media, it seems like everybody is just able to draw from their memory or from their referencing and without guidelines or anything like this or without referencing, all of a sudden, you know, those are classified as people as being more than or, or better than, right? As than a current student, as you may be. And something like this is out of my own imagination. I'm not using any reference for this. 
would I use any sort of reference to help me and assist with it? Sure, but did I need to? No. Do I need to use reference to draw stuff like this? I don't. I can draw lines out of my head if I want to from any pose, position, you know, level of detail. I can draw a leopard out of my own memory if I want to. But I am not against drawing them from, from referencing because the reference will give me more information on things that I can't remember. Because I don't remember every single bit of information or detail about any of these animals. And especially animals that don't exist anymore. I'm, I'm making this stuff up. In combination of things I do know. I'm looking at things like birds in the past and things I remember. And then there I just make up my angle and pose. You know? This is also from out of my own head. This is out of my own head. But at the same time, I'm not going to shy away from the reference. But now the question still is for Vico. How can I build a confidence to... Um, draw from the imagination you know as a beginner not to let's say don't use the word break away from the reference but to integrate the reference more appropriately right and i think the appropriate way maybe able to do so is first yeah study the reference and draw it as it may be interpret it through the use of form and shape but then from there the typical thing we do in dynamic sketching is to use that reference of guideline to be able to augment that image so let's say i had a reference of a, of a lion right and pose in a certain way and let's say i'm going to take that reference of the lion and I'm just going to move the posing a bit differently. I want to move the head a bit more to the left. I want to move the paw a little bit higher. I want to change the camera angle a little bit lower. It's the same reference image. It's the same similar kind of posing, but the image has now been altered and manipulated based on how I want to just shift things around. That's the first step, right? Because I'm now trying to visualize what that could also be perceived like on the page, even though it's not necessarily the image itself. But the image is something similar to it. It's a starting point. From there, I can now go a bit further from the reference image that I have I want to now move the camera much more strongly in a different position. I want to change the pose much more than it was before. Then I'll even take away the reference completely. And now I want to draw from the memory of that line, knowing how to construct it and making up my own poses, making up my own things. But it's constructed from all the numerous uh, amounts of data that are collected, which will take however long it will for you. For some people, it'll take years. Some people, it'll take a lifetime. For me, it took 20 plus years, right? Um, so if you're, if you're following my timeline, do you, are you going to give yourself 20 years to do this? If you're saying, man, 20 years is way too long. Well, I mean, if you're saying, I'm going to try to do this within five years. I'm not saying that's impossible, as most people are asking timeline-wise. But what if it doesn't happen? Do you just give up then at that point? Well, you'll probably just keep going, you know? And then before you know it, 20 years may have passed, right? And then you'll have the same kind of perceptions I will. Um, but if time is the, the factor in terms of your commitment to this thing, then you won't last. Because for me, it doesn't matter how long it'll take. I'm just going to do this every day anyways. You know? DS is, is uh, asking, do you have a point and shoot camera when you use for references while you're out and about? Or do I use my phone? I use a, a phone camera, which phone cameras right now are powerful. So being on location, even if you're traveling to the places like in Kenya for the Masai Mara, yeah, some of the animals are far away, but some of the animals are literally right next to you. So you don't need this super powerful camera to take reference shots. Uh, a phone is more than capable these days. At the same time, you know, as I'm traveling that far and I'm trying to get good quality reference images also, and I'll use my phone, I'm also going to invest in a camera system that I know is going to give me something a bit stronger quality uh, compared to a phone. You know, because that's what it's built for. So yeah, I have a, I have a, you know, a rig that I've um, put together in terms of lenses of camera for the camera, body that I'm using, and how many cameras I've been bringing with me. Uh, whenever I travel, I'll usually have a camera with me in general. Then I just start picking and choosing the lens I want to take, you know, to that location, knowing what I'm going to shoot. If I shoot landscapes, I'll shoot wide angle lens. I have a 24 millimeter. If I shoot telephoto, you know, for the animals and wildlife, I usually bring my 200, 600 millimeter. And this isn't stuff I like bought overnight. You know, this is stuff I accrued over, you know, a decade of time. Well, some of the stuff. This is less, less, the more recent things in the last couple of years, right? <laughs> but I do have a lot of other lenses and, you know, bodies and stuff like that I've purchased at that time. Okay, uh, so for those of you that are joining in right now, uh, we're just drawing this dinosaur using this very particular new nib that I've got. This is the nib made by Kaki Mori, and I'm using the carbon ink from Platinum, 
And we're just testing out some of the lines over here, just seeing how the quality felt on this really rough paper so far. A-OK. -okay. This is an A-plus in personal uh, use so far for me. And I'm being very honest about it in terms of how I feel about this nib. I think it's been a solid performer, in my opinion. I had no expectation this was a gift given to me. Uh, literally got it yesterday. And uh, this is my first time using this uh, inking nib. This is a dip style ink. If they made a fountain pen or something like this one, I would purchase it instantly. This is nice. We're probably only going to go about maybe 15, 20 more minutes left over. Uh, let's just sketch something else real quick here. Give me one second as I move some stuff around. Jay Decker is asking, how uh, do you have any advice on how to handle the clarity of shapes whose values are really close together, creating a very soft edge or gradation? Um, I mean, you're, you're talking about transition of value structure, you know, because, you know, when, when the, when the forms are very parallel, uh, let's say close together. One example would be like, um, if you have a plane to plane, let's say we don't define a line for that corner of the plane. Uh, but let's say the values, which now is in shadow using a hatching system is equal. How do we differentiate between one plane shift to the other? And that's within the value shifting, right? It's all dependent upon the light direction. Depending on where the light is, you know, you would shift it. But let's say the, the uh, light is coming from this direction. Then I'm going to say the edge and corner of this plane is going to be slightly darker. There could be some bounce light coming in from this direction or from the ground, so it occupies the, the kind of light underneath. But still, I'm going to use hatching to punch that side a little bit more. Or what I like to do a lot of times with hatching is I will alternate the angle. So let's just say I don't necessarily push the value like this. I'll hatch in one direction. And let's say the values are somewhat equal. I'll shift the direction of hatching. Because even though the values here are the same, practically, because of the shifting of line, we can differentiate between where it turns at a corner. So at the top plane, let's say there was a bit of a shadow there too. I will switch the angle of line. Then also things like line density, line weight, can also help as well too, right? So it's either going to be a literal value shift, where it goes dark to light and gradation like this, so we can now see the actual plane edge, or we can even do things like hatching directional change, if that makes sense. I, I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking about, but hopefully that kind of is relatable. Um, I don't really have a system of how to organize references for myself, DS. They just tend to be dropped in a folder a lot of times. As artists, sometimes we can be disorganized about stuff like that, but you, know, you, can, you can use certain uh, programs I know that are out there, uh, certain referencing kind of mood board programs. I can't remember the name of what it was, but uh, there is stuff out there for that. Steven, is my fountain pen still in the works? Yes, it is. With Estherbrook, it is still going to be in play. I need to actually send over a review to the company this uh, coming week or two uh, so they have the information to go forward with the production. So uh, that is still being planned. To Tank said, your daughter got a score of 249 out of 300 in her archery shooting contest. That's awesome. Congratulations to her. And her team got first place. Fantastic. Uh, and this is in West Virginia, homeschool. Archery team, she's only been shooting for three months. Wow. Uh, sounds like a bit of a natural. Congratulations to your daughter, uh, Tech to Tank. Maybe the Olympics in her in the future. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's move on from here. Let this dry a little bit. Question for Platinum is how do you go from the big shapes to the smaller details? Really find myself stuck only on drawing the big shapes. Well, I mean, practicing even studies separately about study of surfacing, reference uh, uh, textures and details and features and stuff like that. Uh, even callouts. 
right? Specifically, I want to do a head study primarily. Instead of the entire body, I'm going to focus on just the head. I'll build the head forms and then move into the medium level stuff, not the small things, but the small, the medium level, which could be the features of the brow, the cheekbone, uh, the mouth, the nose, the eyes. The small stuff then goes into, let's say, the fine hairs or the render practice of hatching, uh, surfacing texture, that kind of stuff, right? So you can categorize the layers of sizing and you're going from large to small, but go from large, medium to small. Thank you, Vico. Uh, Peer ref, that's the one. Am I a pineapple on pizza or no pineapple on pizza? I've eaten pineapple on pizza when I was a kid. I didn't mind it as much. Today, I I have no real preference, but would it be my go-to? No, I would not be going to pineapple on pizza. <laughs> uh, I prefer um, meat and veggies, but I really, I'm a big onion person. I love green peppers. I love onions, green onions, uh, but also the variation of slight meats, um, pizza and stuff like that is what I like. I'm not a big mushroom fan though. Something about the texture of it doesn't really do it for me. Much like eggplant. It's too, I don't know, mushy. Not a big fan of it. The flavor is okay. The earthiness of flavor is something that is, is kind of all right to me, but for some reason, uh, when it comes to consuming or eating um, as a food source, mushrooms and stuff like that, hasn't been my go-to, but I love onions. I'll eat onion raw. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have any problem with that. Question here is any advice for those afraid to pursue art as a career? Uh, I love to be working professional one day, but the potential inability or instability um, lulls of work keep me from ch uh, keep me chained to a desk job unrelated to art. I mean, it's a it's a loaded question <laughs> i could discuss this for hours on end um when it comes to this idea of of overcoming this fear to pursue something you might potentially love you know at the end of the day we could say anything you pursue is a risk in life and there's no guarantee that it'll work out even the, the the professional let's say job you have right now you know that keeps, keeps you chained to a desk is not guaranteed you could be let go tomorrow due to whatever reasons of uh, the company's you know, inability to financially balance itself or uh, they don't get enough work in, the economy might drop out, something, you know? Um, your job is not guaranteed for your lifetime. So anything in pursuit can have a risk. But we also can understand that, well, for some have a much better conscious understanding than others, you can understand time is limited. You know, you have one go around this rock uh, in terms of your life. So you can say, well, I'm gonna wait, you know, uh, and I'll wait another couple of years and see what the industry is like or see if I have a skill set. I'll just practice a little bit here and there. And maybe when I'm a bit older, I'll make a full commitment and choice to this. I mean, for those of you that are a bit younger in age, you might feel comfortable to make that kind of decision. But if you have a career and you've got a family and all this stuff, it's like, well, a lot of other responsibilities are coming up. And this choice of trying to make this transition of becoming something you want to actually do may be harder to make a choice towards. But the longer you wait, the percentage of that becomes much more minimal. Granted, just because of time, and because of your age, and because of your commitments and responsibilities continue to grow. Those never go away, you know? Um, so if you can't do it now, you're probably not going to do it tomorrow. It's as simple as that, right? If you just can't draw today, then you know you using it for some sort of professional application is probably not going to happen. And so, if you can't draw today, why can't you draw today? Well, it's like I can't draw very good, or people won't like it, or it's not what I expected it to be. I I'm not going to get to those levels, and that's holding me back because I don't want to try. I'm afraid of it because it doesn't look very good. I'm going to be judged. We've already killed it. No one's telling you this. I'm saying that, <laughs> but. As you're sitting there by yourself, you could be telling yourself this. It's just you. So really, at the end of the day, you have to overcome yourself. And this is going to be the hardest thing, as most of us as cliche in a way kind of understand that. You're fighting your own reflection, right? And so that fear is very internal. It's something very personal to you that you have to now figure out what best and how to overcome it. Um, but the best way to begin in terms of pursuing this, not even a career, but this it's got to be a passion. It can be turned into a career. The byproduct that could be giving you a good financial situation, but it can't be the reason of that. 
if you just want to find work and good money, don't use art. It's too hard, okay? But could it give you a strong um, financial security within a career sense? It could, but it's not guaranteed again, you know? But if you love to do this, and this is the only thing you can think about, you're just obsessed with it, well, then it's for you, you know? It's for you. Um, but again, when you have responsibility, it makes it tougher. So of course, there's no actual way to do it. There's no path or thing I could say to you, like, this is how you have to follow A, B, to C, and you'll get there. I can't do this because I don't have the answers. The only thing you can do is to try and to have no regret is with this thing. Because you can wake up at 55, 60 years old one day and think like, man, I should have just sat there and drew. I should have just sat there and created something, you know? Uh, instead of thinking back, it's like, I could have, and you didn't. Or you said you, 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 or, um, that you, you could have tried and nothing you know, didn't really happen. Wouldn't you rather have that, though? Then wondering or assuming or regretting that you at least try, you know, uh, that's the way it is for me. Um, you know, but thankfully in my young age, in, when I was younger in age, I was able to pursue that. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I would draw now. Uh, what should we draw? Um, anybody with a suggestion? I could draw another animal, dinosaur, maybe a character. Uh, I was, we were watching Conan the other day. Uh, draw a bunch of Conan stuff. Let's see here. Think of something. How about let's go for maybe something? We talked about environmental. You know, I said I didn't want to draw something with an environment, but maybe we do something uh, drawing of a creature with an environment or background. Okay, uh, animalistic. Creature base with a little bit of environmental background. Let's try that. Let's put let's put this dude, little dude over here. I'll, I'll zoom in to this part because I'm going to start at a very small area, so you kind of have to up close see it. You'll see what I'm going to draw now. I've already decided. I don't know what's going to look like, but <laughs> if it fails miserably, I apologize. Um, we'll see. I'm going to draw them fairly small. And um, I'm kind of imagining, I don't, I don't have a picture in my head, but I'm trying to imagine like what's happening or what's behind them. Because I'm imagining some kind of like structure back here. Let's put him in some clothes. And uh, let's say he's an he's a onion farmer. And he's walking away from his little hut and house over here. I have no idea. We'll see. <laughs> um, people said onions. People said raccoons. Uh, someone said background and something. So we'll just mix and match all that stuff together. We shall see. As I do so, uh, let me just quickly read real fast. Um, General was saying, do you sometimes do a drawing of a creature with an environment or back up of, oh, okay, we talked about that already. Um, well, that's what I'm gonna do now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you saying, yeah, yeah, dude, uh, got laid off several times and just general stress of working environment. COVID and other health factors made you, uh, intentional about pursuing art and not waiting around yeah definitely <clears throat> the 
Brian is saying, this is admittedly childish, but I still struggle with doing art rather than sometimes um, or something easier like watching TV or playing video games. Do you struggle with this? If not, do you ever? Well, I mean, to me, drawing and creating art had the same effect or feeling as playing games or reading comics, watching a movie. The experience was no different. That's the way it has to go about it. It's, it's a mindset change, Brian. Because maybe drawing right now for you is becoming this burdened effect that you have to somehow train or perform or produce something at an expected level of outcome. And it's a struggle. You know, it's, it's, it's draining. So because of this, why would you, you know, want to um, spend all that time doing that? Because it's, it's, it's taking away from you. So to relax and to, you know, uh, have, a, have a, a time, to, a moment for just things that you enjoy. If you'd rather play games and watch movies and stuff like this. Um, but if you can find a way to mentally change the, the way you perceive creating and drawing and doing art. Where it's no longer about trying to generate this expected thing, but it's a similar approach, which is just play again. It's entertainment at first. It doesn't have to be for entertainment or, or something except for just you. Um, and taking away that mentality of you know how it's supposed to look and what it's supposed to compete to also. Um, those things are not easy to do, of course, because you're surrounded by uh, you know an influx of things on social media about what it tells you you should be doing or how you should be doing it and the quality of things. Um, but still, that is the factor, right? So for myself, you know, when I was a kid, uh, playing with toys and creating worlds and ideas about fantasy of imagination of storytelling and uh, worlds and how these characters kind of interacted with each other, it was no different to me than just playing with that as drawing. So I guess that's, you know, really the part in which it, it, it may sound like childish behavior but when it comes to like pursuing a, a, a career within what we're doing you know you gotta have fun with this <laughs> if you're not having fun with it then why are you doing it you know it, again if it's just a career for a job there's a lot of other things you'd be doing um which would make you a, a lot more money more guaranteed in some ways but they're all hard you know everything is hard that's life I need to draw a bit quickly because uh, after this, I have a class. So I have a class at 5, and it's 4.20 our time right now. So uh, I'm going to try to get as much as I can. I should have kept back better track of time, but um, I thought I would have been done here before. But I have a class at 5 o'clock, so, um, and I've already been talking, and I have to talk for another 3 or 4 hours with these uh, students next. So um, I will try to get as much as I can. And like I said, I'll be back on next week. So if you want to come out and hang out that time next week, please do so. Hopefully today's session you guys have been able to enjoy uh, the time of hanging out, discussion, talking, advice, and just drawing. If you've been drawing and sketching with us, great. Please do share it. Tag me if you want to. Uh, please help share the, the channel and the page. You guys can subscribe. Here's a bit of a environmental landscape. We'll put some rocks around here. And we're going to put his hut right back over here. But the thing is, you know, it's like this, this other stuff that we're talking about, the, the games and the entertainment stuff that we enjoy. I'm not saying that you should get rid of them either, by the way. Because today I still like playing games and I still like watching a lot of movies. I watch movies all the time. Um, but I'm still going to, you know, create and draw and do the things I normally should be doing in terms of my uh, expected deadlines or stuff that I'm working on. I'm also just drawing for myself because, again, it's entertaining. But I'm not going to disallow myself from also having fun with other things that I have interests in, right? It's all about balance. 
because even the things that you do, let's say watching game or playing games and watching movies are going to be extremely helpful for you in terms of creating stories, finding inspiration. If it's just escapism, I mean, that's one thing. But as I said earlier, it's like, those are all the things that we need to, to build the, uh, the, the data, the library, the inspiration. I'm building this some kind of a conical structure here. I'm just going to build it up lightly. And we'll start indicating the interior parts a little bit. Let's find a path trailway over here. Landscape, rocks, vegetation, bush, trees in the background. And we're going to keep moving a little bit faster so I can get as much as I can get done. And I'll give myself at least a 20 minute break so before I go to class. Jojo saying, if I have an idea about a drawing, does it make sense to wait until I'm better at drawing to draw it? No, of course not. Uh, you, you, if you have an idea of something that you find fascinating, uh, excited about, um, invigorating, or even very visually strong in your mind, express it. Doesn't matter the outcome, just put it on the page. And what I'm saying is, I, it's important to get it out there because you need to have that kind of experience of putting it onto the page so that in the future, as you do get better, and you look at that drawing, it's not to judge it by saying, man, that was a bad drawing back then. Is to say, look at that piece and by saying, I love that idea. I still love it to this day. And I know I can draw it better. And you'll do it again. Right? It's not about judgment. It's about being able to express. And knowing that your skills will always grow. But if you don't act on it, that idea that you love may fizzle away. Or the opportunity to grow or to learn something from it will never happen. You have to act on it. Because that mentality will never shift if you keep that. You know, this idea that, you know, I'm, if, I'm not good enough, so I shouldn't pursue this thing. Do you ever think as you progressively grow and mature that you won't have a thought of like, that you're not good enough? That you could always be better? I mean, for myself, I think I could be better. Always want to do it. And I'll learn from it and I'll make a better version of it in the future. It's fine to ask that. It's, it's normal to think that way. Uh, but what I am saying is, you don't have to... Um, if you're looking for someone to say it's okay, I'm saying to you it's okay. Okay, uh, Go for it. Yeah, this is the Kakimori Nib. It's fantastic so far. I, I, I think it's honestly one of the best nibs I've used. Because I don't really use a lot of nibs, but the normally ones I use are like the, the manga versions or the classical dip pen nibs. And I'm not really a big fan of them a lot of times. But this one I've actually really liked. The line is great and they get a lot of variation of it. It's super lightweight. Handles like a dream. Produces a consistent line. Holds the ink uh, pretty well. Little characters in the background. Maybe it's like a little village. Yeah, volume two of Dynamic Bible hopefully will be out this year. 
I'm planning to start working on it and getting it done by this coming month. Uh, I need to. If I need to get it out print by this year, it needs to be done now. <laughs> Uh, as Superani is saying. So um, they've approved it. They're okay with going forward and producing the next version. So um, I need to start as soon as possible. But I'm shooting for this year. We didn't produce it earlier because there was a lot of commotion about, you know, Kim Junkie's passing and all that kind of stuff. And they put a halt on a lot of book printing. Uh, but now they're getting back into it. And um, we are... Go ahead. He's going off to the farm with a little rucksack. A little scene of him going off to work. I didn't draw any onions, though, but <laughs> the intention is that he's going to find onions. Okay, we're good. Um, if anybody has any last questions, comments, please let me know. But I appreciate you guys hanging out, asking all the questions that you did. Uh, I hope you guys found today's sessions to be entertaining, um, enlightening to some degree, but also encouraging for you guys to continue on your own. Uh, here we've been using... The uh, Kakimori did. Do I have a perspective grid in mind? Not for this piece, no. Nope. Everything was about spacing, front to back, you know, scale, uh, overlap, 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 which gives you the depth of perspective. In any case, next week, I'm hoping to go back on again. Today is Wednesday, so maybe next Wednesday or Thursday, I'll come back on. Uh, I'll announce it on my social media account on Instagram. Just keep an eye on that, and I'll be back at some point. And uh, do, like I said, subscribe and, and um, help me share this channel. Let it keep growing. And uh, that'll entice me to keep coming back. And we'll do more in the future, right? All right, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. I will see you all next time. Thank you.